Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody inside and outside the ballpark. My name is Novid Player, and welcome to episode 27 of the Novid Notes podcast, where we talk about many different types of creators across the VR chat platform and the amazing things they do. With me today, I have uh, a multiple community leader uh, from many different types of communities uh, inside of the VR chat platform, uh, Blaze Creek. Blaze Creek, welcome to the podcast. Hope you're well. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, not a problem. So I was going to say, you know, first and foremost, uh, for the general listening audience at home, um, you know, what exactly do you do inside of the VRChat platform? Uh, hi, my name is Blaze Creek. Uh, I'm the leader of the Hapus and Abyssals, founder of four communities, three of them for VRChat. And I'm also a community ambassador for a different VR social platform. But in VRChat, we do a bunch of stuff. We do Hapu raids for Hapu Foundation, among various other typical Discord and in-game events that you'd expect. For our police community, we do several different kinds of roleplay. I think we're up to like six or seven right now, um, distinct forms of uh, roleplay, acting as their own departments to form our division. We also have Fellowship of Knoll, which does a whole bunch of culty shit. Like, if you thought Hapus were culty, they're they're the more cultish role play. They they do a bunch of stuff like that. Your typical events too, and uh, yeah, we do a bunch of fun stuff on VR chat. Whether it's kidnapping people to turn them into our kind of people, or Hapus, or you know your typical events like a karaoke night or a game night. We do a bunch of stuff. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, yeah, I'll say it definitely sounds like a lot of you know a lot of different things when it comes to all the communities. So out of curiosity, you know, just to kind of get into your origins a little bit. So what exactly got you into VR chat in the first place? Um, I think it was back in like early 2017, but I saw a bunch of early videos, like knuckles weren't around yet. No major memes were around yet. And it looked really interesting and fun. Like I think nags was the first content creator that I really started watching back in the day. And then through his content, um, I ended up wanting to buy a VR headset and I was like, this is pretty cool. I got a Vive, the first one. And, uh, I, I tried it on desktop back in like mid 2017. And then for my birthday later that year, uh, early 2018, I got that headset and I'd been playing ever since. And it's a social outlet. It lets people who may or may not have uh, a social uh, social circle in real life experience human interaction. And for those who don't know, hi, I'm autistic and bipolar. Uh, social interaction is not necessarily a thing that I'm historically great with. VR is an amazing outlet for stuff like that because you can make friends and, uh, well, have social interactions without having to physically be present, which is pretty helpful if you're socially inept or learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there there are so many, you know, amazing people when it comes to the platform, um, you know, that all come together to make amazing things. Uh, so kind of to, you know, go into that a little bit. So what made you kind of start, you know, community development and like going into like communities and stuff? I mean, I'd always been around old school communities like um, some people might remember AOD who used to do like Battlefront and like Battlefield. But I'd been around a lot of those kind of communities when I was growing up. Um, but for VR chat, I was never really involved in any communities up until I formed my own. Like I was kind of hanging around some of them. Um, but I wasn't really involved in any. I'd kind of just been a passive observer or like a very minor part of whatever I had been involved in up until that point. But the reason I wanted to get involved with communities is because at the time, Hapus weren't really raiding or that active. Um, I didn't make Hapus by any means. I know that gets attributed to me a lot because I do run the largest Hapu community. But that, that honor goes to Project H and, you know, all the folks who technically pioneered the original concept. I just took it and made it a, a little bit more modern and, well, a lot more organized. But it was one of those things where people weren't really doing what we were doing anymore. None of the communities who were active were actively doing what I loved about Hapus. No one was raiding. There weren't big gatherings. We weren't turning people into us anymore. We weren't doing what we'd always done. So I wanted that sense of community because originally I wasn't 
brought in by another hapu group i was brought in by you know a friend group of hapus who just um were kind of vibing doing their own thing kidnapping people to their little friend group so i didn't really have that same experience as most people did back in the day of being brought into one of the larger groups i wanted that same sense of community and that same style of hapus that i was brought into and i kind of developed that over the years and completely made it into my own thing if we're being entirely honest hapus have come a long way in the four years that we've been doing what we've been doing Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, I guess, you know, one of the big questions that, you know, probably some viewers may be wondering right now, um, because we've, we've said the name so many times, but what exactly is a hoppy? <laughs> well it's a little hard to explain without giving away the fun or you know selling the secret of what we are or what we do hapus are an avatar or a character you could think of it as a species or a culture hapus are multifaceted in terms of what it actually means you could be referring to the avatar you could re be referring to people but Hapu itself is based off of Northern Princess from Kantai Collection, or Kankol. It's a character from multiple sources, but Hapu itself is very distinct to VRChat. It's not from the original, you know, source material, uh, material of Kankol, but it is based off of the Northern Princess, which is one of the quote-unquote bad guys in that series, if you want to look at him like that. But yeah, hapus are little creatures, big creatures. They come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. They can be fennecs, they can be mechas, they can be moths, they can be more or less whatever you imagine. They could even be an eldritch abomination of nothing but eyes and mouths on the floor, as long as it fits within certain criteria. Hapus are a lot of things, but for the most part, the main defining features are the eyes and the head. That's generally how you can tell if something is a hapu or not. There are also abyssals, which are technically just the adult version of hapus, but terminology gets rather confusing the farther down the ladder uh, rabbit hole you go. But yeah, hapus, they're small. They like to stare at you. They, they will steal your soul and kidnap you to a different dimension, a different realm. Fair, fair enough. I, this is actually the first time I've actually heard like semi of the lore of the Hapus. So this is a, it's very interesting to me. <laughs> I mean, I know they've been around we for very eons. secretive. Of course. Yeah. I'll say they, they've been around for eons. So, or at least what it feels like it to be. Um, cause I remember been here since the beginning, man, yeah, <laughs> it's all a conspiracy, man. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah so you know uh, out of out of curiosity you know what kind of led to you know the creation of the hapu foundation i mean realistically it was more so uh, i could repeat some of what i said earlier but other groups weren't doing hapu stuff nobody was doing hapu rating nobody was doing the kind of hapu stuff that I appreciated or that I was brought into like you didn't have gatherings of people anymore at the same scale or magnitude that we once did but the way that hapus also worked from an organizational level wouldn't really work on a large scale I I wanted to bring back the culture that I loved and that I was introduced to all those years ago for VR chat because hapus for me were it was something that brought new friends, yeah, but it was also kind of like its own culture in a way. An isolated group of people, kind of, not like an isolated tribe by any means, but we were very much doing our own thing away from everybody else's business and having a good time while doing it. And, you know, that wasn't really a thing at the time when I made the community. You had other groups doing some stuff, obviously, and people were having fun. But what I wanted just wasn't there. And how I wanted Hapus to be, it wasn't really there either. There was a lot of conflict back then about what was and what wasn't, how things should be or how things shouldn't be. And to be fair, I kind of set the standard for how Hapus are and aren't. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, interpretation. People can obviously say a Hapu is this, a Hapu is that. There's, there's a lot of room for... Uh, what is and isn't and obviously we don't want to set anything too much in stone because it's not our original concept to be fair but 
we took the original idea of Hapus and we expanded on it to a degree that I don't think anybody would have expected. And we've taken it to places that I don't think anyone would have expected either. But it really boils down to we just wanted somewhere where people could be Hapus again. We wanted a place where we could share our culture and do what we've always done. So we made it and we did it. <laughs> no, that's that's absolutely fair. So I, I guess out of curiosity, um, you know, because you're talking about the Hapu raids and stuff. So out of curiosity, has there ever been any like I, this is just where my mindset's going on this. Is, has there any been like any raid clashes where like you and let's say like, you know, for example, like Ugandan <laughs> Knuckles like clashed at like raided the same instance or uh, like local police yeah. department or anything like that? It happens frequently. We have rules and guidelines for interacting with other communities. Um, all of our groups do. Um, LPD is not a daily occurrence anymore, but for a long time it was. We would end up in the same instances by, you know, mere happenstance. And we sometimes would work with them for role play. Sometimes we just give them the world. Sometimes they'll give us the world. It really depends because communities in general, at least say at the level of like LPD and Hapu Foundation, we have pretty well understood boundaries of what's acceptable and what isn't in terms of how to interact along with like, okay, if so-and-so is a part of this party and so-and-so is a part of this party, it's probably okay if we do something or if we interact, but it really depends on the community. Like for the Knuckles, sure, in the past, there have been some times that we might've joined in on the Knuckles or had a random Knuckle group join in on one of our events. You can't really help random funny moments like that, especially if there's no like pre-planning or organization. But yeah, there have been some times where we've uh, interacted with other groups in a higher capacity. We've had a lot of fun with the LPD. They're probably, not even probably, to be fair, the LPD is historically one of the only groups that we've consistently interacted with over the past, like, give or take four years. They're awesome people, and every new administration that's come in has been pretty receptive of us. They've been great people. So, in general, you know, when the interaction presents itself and it's appropriate, we will normally interact. It's just, you know, not everybody's going to be on the same page as us and not everybody's going to have the same boundaries. So it's hit or miss. It's very circumstantial, uh, circumstantial if we're going to interact or not. No, that's totally understandable. And, you know, with that, you know, because there's so many different types of groups in that regard uh, when it comes to, you know, raid groups uh, or going into instance to interact with the community. Um, I mean... You know, there's, of course, you know, obviously the Hapus, there's the Ugandan Knuckles, LPD, uh, there's, oh gosh, there's there's quite a few that I'm, I'm just blanking there's, on at the moment. There's over 200 roleplay communities for anyone who's interested. It's a fun <laughs> fact. There's just shy of 200 roleplay communities. Fair. It's an insane fact. Right. And I was going to say, you know, there's, there's literally something for everybody, um, no matter how you look there at it, is. it um which is why at least in my opinion vr chat is a place where literally anybody can enjoy themselves and what they do um within reason within reason i'm gonna straight that right now <laughs> within reason um but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh don't want that getting clipped out of context <laughs> um <laughs> but uh but yeah, so I was going to say, because you've been around for, you know, quite a long time, because um, if I remember correctly, you have over 10,000 hours within this platform uh, alone, if I remember correctly. Yeah, just in VR chat itself. On Steam, it says seven or 8,000 hours. Fun fact, for like a solid year or two, the optimal way to launch this game wasn't through Steam, because for the longest time, you had clients that would just straight up fucking lift your data from Steam. It's not something I'm a fan of. So a couple thousand hours aren't logged. Right now I'm sitting at like 8,000 hours for VR chat. I should be over 10K though. I've played this game for too fucking long. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> but, you know, so you've been around for quite a long time in that regard. So, you know, what is one of the things when it came from like when you first started to now that, you know, what was like the biggest difference between then and now? At least in your opinion. Oh, God. 
The biggest difference by far, like this, this doesn't take any time to think about at all. Back when I first started playing, you didn't have not safe for work avatars everywhere. You didn't have client users. You didn't have crashers. You didn't have fucking 90% of the issues that we have nowadays. Way back when, you had a couple thousand people playing the game, and everyone was just, like, hyped as fuck to see an animation for the first time. Like, if you had an even slightly functional avatar, that was top-tier crazy. Like, the moment animation started coming out on avatars, people lost their shit. But, like, nowadays, it's kind of insignificant, because we see all of these crazy additions to avatars, like the, the toggles, for instance, being able to change clothing. That was not, like, common or a thing back then. The old SDKs, man, if you were making avatars of that complexity, you were seen as, like, a god in the community. <laughs> you were seen as someone of high status. So, comparing it now to then, I think a lot of the issues come down to... You know, avatars not being properly moderated against. So many of them have not safe for work just out and about. You can see uh, anime big old jiggly titties fucking everywhere, man. <laughs> it's literally <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, that's, but that's facts. I, I, I think that's it, really. <laughs> Clients, anime titties. I think that's a pretty large aspect of the differences because you didn't really have not safe for work avatars back then. You didn't have anything like that. People were just importing like old game assets. Nobody really had custom stuff. Nobody had an idea that you could do loot yet. It was like 2019 when that stuff started popping off. More like mid-2018, but yeah, the differences are not subtle by any means. No, absolutely. And kind of to keep on this topic a little bit, because um, you've seen worlds and, you know, things come and go. Um, so if you had to revive, let's say, one thing about back then that's no longer existent and bring it into now, what would it be? Yo, so I don't know how many people remember the name Zero, but they made Gaia Knight. Uh, that's one of my favorite worlds of all fucking time. I love that place. Top tier, amazing. I wish it was still populated and people actually played it or played in it. It's got a cool little like Easter egg. It's a top tier world. And I probably spent 500 to 1,000 hours just there. And it's where I was converted into a hapu. Uh, the video's not public anymore. I still have it though. But that's the world that uh, Fancy and a few others kidnapped me into what I am today. I hey. fucking love that place. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. No, Guy at Night was a was one of those legendary worlds. And I think there is a I don't know Hell if it yeah. was re imported or what what because I know uh during the VR chat ten year anniversary, uh Project Community held like a an old school world hop night and we we had went. Damn. Um and it was probably the most people I've seen in a Gaia Night instance in forever. <laughs> um I uh, bet, honestly. It's been forever. I think, I want to say Zero had plans to bring it back, but I don't, don't quote me on that, because I, I don't know for sure. But fair. it'd be cool if it was up to date and brought to, you know, f I don't want to say full steam again, because it was like VRChat's primary world for a minute, or at least it felt like that. It was always popping off back in the day. People were always there. I know by today's standards, it's kind of subpar, especially like, I know the camera can't see the world we're in right now, but VR chat's come a very long way since then. And I can see why it's not as popular now as it would have been. I do want it to come back though. <laughs> no, that, no, trust me, I, I would too in that regard. Um, so let's Hell talk, yeah. let, let's talk more, you know, um, because yeah, Guy at Night, oh, dude. Now you got me reminiscing on Guy at Night now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but kind of to go more into uh, some of the communities you you run, you know. So we talked hmm. quite a bit about Hapu Foundation. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the other ones. So uh, Abyssal Police Division. So what what kind of started Abyssal Police Division? So. A lot of it can be attributed to one of our members named Neko-san. He, he was kind of playing around with the concept of um, Hapu Police. Now, I guess I should preface, 
we were doing hapu related police activities before all this there's obviously like the old school hapu police department and like those concepts from way back when we still kind of played on those a little bit um under hapu foundation but it wasn't until neko san made our first base for our police avatars that we really started to play around with the concept a little bit more We wanted to expand into a more casual, like, Hapu rating itself isn't a very serious form of roleplay. So we wanted to expand into something that was more like, not casual casual, but something that's a little bit more structured and organized. So having, you know, Hapu police officers and a general concept that we already had played around with a little bit, it kind of just made sense to expand this fun little roleplay that, you know, we'd been playing with. into uh, something a little bit more and over time you know we prototype different uh, um, badges different titles different like operational aspects of how we actually wanted this uh, division or department at the time to be ran and um, so yeah a lot of it can be attributed to hapu's just wanting to try new things um, us wanting to expand into more serious role play and Also, you know, Neko-san kind of just handing us this fucking dope avatar. <laughs> so it's kind of like, how couldn't we make something cool, man? We get gifted this awesome avatar that we can use as our base. Of course, we're going to expand on it. So we did. And it, it, it took a long time for APD to actually get started, to, like, get established. It was off and on, like, prototyping for a couple of years. It was originally an internal role play for Hapu Foundation. And then um, we tried launching it as its own community under a set of leaders and a team, but it was too much for that team and those leaders to handle. So they tried flip-flopping back and forth for about a year. Um, and then we ended up bringing on new people to take over the project. And um, it's been fucking great ever since. They, they've pretty much got all the kinks sorted out by now. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we've got several distinct role plays. You could kind of think of Abyssal Police Division as um, several departments making up the division, unlike your typical police department. We have our officers, which kind of count as their own department, our enforcers. I'm going to have to pull up the whole list of all of them. Oh my god, we've got too many. Holy shit. We have our enforcers, our mages, our engineers, our medics, our detectives, our constables, which are our officers... And uh, we also have various sub roles for role play too. Like there's uh, our chaos creators, and you get the idea. There, there's a lot of elements that go into the APD. You could kind of think of it as um, a giant community with a bunch of sub communities intermixed, almost. Even though all of the role play and all of the organization is taking place within the centralized Discord. So, you know. But APD's got a lot of stuff going on. They're kind of similar to the LPD in some respects, but organizationally and operationally, uh, they're nothing similar. They're not alike in any respect. How we visually present ourselves to the public is also drastically different from the majority of established police communities. Right now, I would say there's around eight active uh, police roleplay communities. I think we definitely have one of the most distinct <laughs> in terms of how we operate and uh, our world design. We, uh, I, I don't want to go too much into the APD structure or how it physically works, but each of our departments kind of function as, compare it to a raid in a sense, like the officers have their poitrols, enforcers have their own version of a poitrol too. They're comparable to how a hop raid works in certain ways while also being similar to how you'd expect the police community to traditionally operate. Um, but it is a little hard to explain without giving away both the magic and certain operational aspects that not everybody needs to know. But yeah. Fair. I was going to say that's it's crazy because now I'm like imagining I'm, I'm genuinely curious um, like because you say it's all within one well because you, you say it's all within one like communal server so if you had to yeah. let's let's say if you had to estimate because i there's probably a lot more than to count but like out of curiosity how many channels does your server have if you have all of these <laughs> 
<laughs> just a buckload, man. <laughs> Listen, holy shit. So for I, I'm gonna use Hapu Foundation real quick as an example. We've hit the server like channel limit constantly. I'm constantly deleting old shit whenever we need new shit. For APD, it's hit that boundary a couple of times. The only reason that it hasn't like capped itself out is because um, all of our communities have associated servers for staff and um, for some of them have their own development servers as well so from an operational standpoint apd's categories you can't see all of them obviously unless you have the associated roles for the you know position so if you're just joining the community it, it looks relatively small comparatively if you're actually a member but uh, it's insane. There's a shitload of categories, and it is confusing as fuck, especially because all of our communities are very similar in their respect of we've either done a lot of stuff over the years or we do a lot of stuff currently. So <laughs> there's a lot of channels. It's a lot of categories. It is insane. Like, wild. Yeah, I was gonna say because I that that was like the first thing when you said you know, you know there is its own there's own this category there's own this category. I'm like, how many channels does this server have? Because it's probably if not the max limit, it's probably close. Pretty much constantly just below the max limit. If they were ever to set the limit lower, we would be fucked. <laughs> Fair. So, kind of, kind of to talk about the Abyssal Police Division a little bit more. Um, so, you know, with you, obviously with the Hapu Foundation, you have like the the Hapu raids. So, what's a what's a, like a typical event for the Abyssal Police Division? It depends on which role you're playing as, but we normally go with our uh, we call them constables. I normally just call them officers. So. Our officers or constables, depending on what you want to call them, I don't want to give away too much about how they operate, how they work, but picture, hmm, what would be a good comparison without just outright telling you how it works? I guess, imagine, you know, you know the LPD, imagine one of their patrols, but uh, a lot jankier. And it's only similar in the respect of the public world, of like us being out in public worlds, doing random janky shit with people. That's like the only real comparison. You know what? I'll, I'll give you a proper example. Our officers generally gather in their home world. They will, you know, get ready for their patrols. They'll go out into public lobbies, not too dissimilar from how Hapu Raid is organized or set up. There's a set amount of people allowed per patrol. Um, they have not necessarily extremely strict guidelines, but we have um, operational guidelines for how we're supposed to interact with other communities, um, you know, how we're going to be expecting our people to behave in public worlds. When we actually get to the public worlds, there are various different ways that they're allowed to interact. Originally, they were only supposed to communicate through... We call these guys Steves, but they're the little balls that you'll see in, like, Kantai Collection or Cancol. Uh, they were supposed to originally use them as communicators because hapus don't speak. We communicate with each other generally telepathically. We're a hive mind, if you will. That's how we see ourselves in lore. So their differences between raiding and uh, patrols is usually the fact that they are allowed to communicate and interact with people. Hapus are not allowed to communicate or interact with people. So they can obviously make arrests. They can interact with role play in a uh, in any given situation. If they want to get into a firefight with somebody, they can do that. If they want to make a typical arrest because someone was found to be a, a quote unquote cute or a nuisance, uh, we can do that. It's not too operationally dissimilar on in certain respects from how the LPD does do their public instances, but operationally in pretty much every other respect. I would say it's pretty different when we get our potential new converts to our uh, precinct or one of our worlds. I'm not going to go through how that process goes, but it is fairly different from everybody else. Um, and how we're allowed to interact with people in worlds is also drastically different from a Hapu raid or another police community. I just don't want to give away too many specific details about how the APD function because to be fair, there are a lot of other police communities out there. 
I don't want any problems with anybody trying to steal from us, as the majority of what we do, operationally speaking, is entirely produced by us. We've had other communities try to steal from us multiple times in the past. So it's one of those things where we want to keep things in-house, both for roleplay and fun, and because saying a little too much without you actually being involved in the roleplay does leave the risk of people trying to take. Which, let me preface, we have helped a lot of communities in the past, we've worked with communities in the past, we don't have an issue, you know, communicating uh, solutions to problems or operational fixes, you know? We, we've actively tried to help other groups. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> that's fair. No, that's fair. Hello, everyone. Real quick, just want to stop the episode right here. I want to thank all of you so much for helping with the podcast and supporting the podcast. Um, I do want to thank you guys so much for watching. I also do want to thank some specific people uh, over on the throne and the Ko-Fi supporter side. Uh, thank you, Jake and Astra for the throne side and for the Ko-Fi side. Thank you, Maple Moose. Uh, if you are interested in supporting me, feel free to check out either of those platforms. Uh, I know on the Ko-Fi side specifically for you know your enjoyment, uh, I do have blooper reels and you know behind the scenes content as well. Uh, from not only the podcast, but from other projects I'm working on. So feel free to check that out. Uh, much love. And thank you guys so much for watching. Let's get back into the episode. Woo. Um, so I guess kind of, you know, in that regard, uh, so that you have the Hapu foundation in the abyssal police division. Um, so let's talk about, uh, fellowship of Knoll. So what, you know, compared okay. to, compared to the other two, you know, what exactly is Fellowship of Null and what exactly happens inside the Fellowship of Null? So people always like to say that Hapus are cultists. Fellowship of Null basically took that meme or that concept and expanded on it. They worship a bell and they have various components um, that are rather cultish in design. The best way to put it is you could think of it kind of like the Hapus. Apu Foundation, but with a more cultish overtheme, and their events are more magical and, uh, I guess, mystical themed. But they worship a bell. They worship Knoll. They have their own subsect of lore, their own reasoning for existing. But it's a little more secretive than APD in terms of how they operationally work, since it is a more. Uh, they take the cultish aspect of the meme pretty hard. You can think of their raids or their crusades, as they're called, as a slightly more intensive roleplay version of a raid. Their activities in game are drastically different from how a traditional raid or a uh, poitrol works. It's heavily magic based, it's heavily cultish in design, and you could think of it kind of like what everybody thinks the hapus do except they're the ones actually doing it <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair um <laughs> well i guess i won't ask too much you know to kind of leave the um aspect of mystery and cult uh cult lore cult cult culture ah um <laughs> there you go uh, a culture i yeah. like it <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, I know some of you are cringing in the comment section or not in the comment section. Hey, listen, it fucking worked. <laughs> it worked this time. <laughs> uh, oh man, but yeah. So I guess one God. of the I guess one of the big questions because you've said it a few times now. Um, so, and I, I guarantee there's probably some people already wondering this question. So, what is the origin of poi, and like how did that? come to the hapus <laughs> like what what led to that being one of the big things about the hapus here i'll i'll take a sip of my smirnoff for for this question because <laughs> it's a loaded question to put it mildly it's a point of contention in the old hapu community fair hmm. enough so poi comes from yudachi yudachi is a character in kantai's uh show around around the whole series. Basically, Udachi says poi more or less constantly throughout the series. Some hapus uh, adopted that to hapu, or a northern princess. There is no direct correlation between Udachi or hapu by any means. But people in the community way before, you know, I founded my communities, um, slowly started associating with 
uh, poi with hapus. Some people did it in a higher capacity, like way back in the day there was a couple different poi translators, which basically turned English or um, I think there was another language too, into uh, variations of poi, like a functional hapu language in a way. So over time, people basically had different interpretations of what poi was, how it fit into hapu. Some people thought, you know, hapus could say poi. Some people explicitly forbid the concept of hapu speaking. And uh, we kind of took the middle ground for a little while. We let some people say poi. We also respected those who didn't want to do it. But the hapu who originally converted me way back when, they poied. It was a big aspect of who they were and like their persona or their character. And I slowly over time started associating poi with hapus in that respect as well. So when time came to make the decision of do we let hapus, you know, poi, what does that mean exactly? Because hapus up until that point were pretty much mostly silent, especially during a hunt or a raid. So we kind of came to the decision, okay, Fancy's been doing this forever. They're an awesome person, and we love that aspect of them. And all these other really great people, they like that aspect a lot. And, you know, it would be really cool to have that component be associated in, like, an official capacity. Make it, like, part of the language, in a way. So we eventually came to the conclusion that Poi would be the Abyssal or the Hapu language. So whenever we speak in-game, if you're not already a hapu or converted into one of us, all you would hear is us saying poi. You wouldn't hear us actually speaking your language or our language, because you're not one of us yet. It's kind of hard to explain in any deeper sense than that without also giving away some other aspects. But hapus are traditionally uh, telepathic in the sense that we communicate to each other without verbalizing. Hence the name, I guess you could, <laughs> hence the name for Project Hapu, I guess, in a way. But yeah, a lot of it comes down to, Hapus are kind of like a hive mind. Abyssals are kind of like a hive mind. Operationally, that's really how it works as well. We use Discord as our main medium for organizing events, organizing raids, and um, controlling or organizing the individual members in an event. So yeah. I'd, I'm going to keep going off on tangent upon tangent, but essentially, poi had a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people. We essentially liked Fancy's interpretation of poi the most, uh, along with a bunch of other people, and eventually wanted to incorporate it into... Uh, incorporate it into a higher respect towards our communities by making it kind of like the language of the hapus, the abyssals. So now we use it tactically. You can poi during raids, you can poi during events. Uh, obviously you can speak towards, you know, you can speak in typical events, but you get what I mean. During any like official hapu activities, you have a way to communicate with people and that's poying. They just don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> I would say funny, funny enough, like I, I was, I was so enthralled with like how you were phrasing it and everything. And I was like, I was like, this sounds like some weird slur. If you really think about it, like, or, <laughs> like, well, it I was does like mean, pollo does mean chicken in Spanish. So you know what? It, it kind of is it's fair. That's fair. Um, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I was like, I hope like, cause like it's, it's, um, uh, like God it shows how old I am. Like, it's like the Smurf concept, you know? Um, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, like they repeat, you know, instead of saying words, they'll say, you know, Smurf for whatever reason. So, like, that's where my mind, yeah. that's where my mindset went. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm like, it's got some similar qualities. I know it's not exactly the same because that's all Hapu say is poi, <laughs> you know, for the most part, because they're supposed to be silent. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it was, to me, it was just something. I, it's just one of those brain farts that just happened. That's it's funny like, as fuck. <laughs> we've been compared to the fucking Smurf so many times, bro. I can't. <laughs> it hasn't happened in like a year or two. I'm cursed. <laughs> uh, I'm dead. I mean, it's no different because, like, it seems like every raid community um, that's based on an avatar per se has that type of like culture behind it. You have the Uganda knuckles tongue clicking, the, the hapu poi. You have, you know, um, 
like oh gosh what's it? i'm trying to think of other examples there's so many that I, i'm trying, I'm to, trying think to think of, of i'm trying to think of others too and i'm not coming up with any but i know there's at least a couple that have some sort of similar niche and to be fair it is a very helpful tool during um raids or those kinds of activities because they do immediately get the attention of whoever the fuck you're around so it is pretty helpful to be able to click or be able to poi yeah I was, I was gonna say with that so i guess one of the questions i wanted to ask of you because you know you you've ran you know these communities and whatnot um i'll say one of the questions i had for you so in the best way possible um what is a typical like from your pov what is a typical event looking like i'll say if you have any like clips or anything that can you know or a certain like event that you have like documented because i can always i can always throw stuff on the screen um, how, how janky can we make it because our media team a couple days ago came out with uh it hasn't been posted on anything yet but um we were doing a raid and it was the end of the raid i didn't realize that we had staff meetings and I, I, I'm, I'm saying, okay, fuck it. We're going to go take a picture over in front of whatever the fuck this thing is. This thing ends up being the twin fucking towers and a plane crashing into it. And I didn't realize what it was at first. And our fucking media team, they were there recording a video. So they got the whole thing. They made a whole, like, I'll send it to you so you can check to see if it's okay or not for this. It's going to go up on our channel, so we think it's okay. But it's it was one of the funniest fucking things I've seen from a raid in a minute. That was too good. <laughs> it, it might be a little monka s, but I mean, it might be a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's nothing crazy that goes on. <laughs> Basically, I see it. I, I see it after like I. I I walk up to it, I say what I say, and then I'm like, oh, fuck, wait a minute, no, we're not doing that, we're not doing that, and then this whole thing <laughs> plays out, it was so fucking funny, but I can send you a clip of, uh, we do have some stuff up on Abyssal Media Group's YouTube channel, it used to be up on Hapu Foundation, we generally don't record or stream any of our activities, but we have been opening up a little bit more, in the past, only like designated people were allowed to stream or record certain things. But a lot of what comes with our events or literally any of our communities is um, pretty much all of our communities. We're, we're relatively isolationist and secretive. We like what we do to be relegated, not necessarily to only us, but we have had a history of people trying to steal from us or, you know, trying to mess with us. So we do like to keep things both relatively secret for both the fun and lore reasons, but also because history has kind of taught us that it's good to keep your secrets relatively uh, secret. <laughs> fair. No, that's fair. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's cool to see that you guys are, to an extent, opening up a little bit. Um, you know, cause I know when, yeah. when you, you had, uh, you, you were told by one of your staff to, you know, come apply for the podcast, you know, um, you were just mentioning how you guys were wanting to open up a little bit more. So it is cool to see that you guys are wanting to open the doors, at least crack the doors a little bit, you know, so crack you know, it open a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> just just yeah. Let, 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 let the cool breeze in, you know, it's, <laughs> that's, you know, it's, it's honestly for the best though. Like, if you think about it, here's a tip to pretty much any community leader or any community that wants to interact with other groups on a larger scale. I think it's awesome. Interacting with other groups is fucking awesome. But know your limits. Don't overinvest yourself. And, uh, you know, don't overinvest into other people that aren't yourself as well. Because communities are a very fickle thing. They come, they go. Leaders come, leaders go it's it's a very bipolar landscape and you know a group could be doing amazing one day and they could fall apart the next i just say uh if you got something good going for yourself it's always you know nice to make friends and it's always nice to interact with other communities but just play your cards right and think about your own interests don't give away everything don't like don't don't give away all your secrets keep it to yourself and don't talk too much, man. That's something that I used to have a big problem with and I still do to these days is not everything's got to be shared. Not everything needs to be known by everyone. And it's especially true if you're a group leader. You've got other people that you need to be considering. Those communities are home to who knows how many people. 
Like, I'll give an example. Hapu Foundation, it, it's home to literally thousands of people, hundreds of active users. People straight up call it their virtual home. And this is the case for who knows how many thousands of communities. Treat your communities with respect, treat other communities with respect, and just have fun and don't sell yourself out. That's all I got to say. Yeah, no, very, very wise words indeed on that regard, because, you know, there's, you said it the best, you know, a lot of people consider their communities that they're a part of their virtual home, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's like a role play or if it's a chill hangout community or a, like a hardcore gamer community, because um, there's True. so many different types of communities, you know, uh, and I'm going to try my dandest to get as much as I can on this damn podcast. That's one of the, one of the many <laughs> w one of the many reasons why, you know, I I like to do this podcast is because I get to see into the minds of, you know, these communities big and small, you know, whether it's, you know, role play or um if it's based on like a map creator or world creator um or an avatar creator, you know, I get to see into the minds of these amazing people and communities, and I get to at least relate to some avail, you know, what it's like to why people are so interested in these communities, why people play this. Yeah. Game. Um, you know, and that's one of the reasons why this podcast exists, you know, um, and granted, while I you totally know, get what you mean, while it's a very small, you know, community you know even having a community of my own for the podcast and you know for the amazing creators and communities that like to hang out together you know that's why i made not only the podcast but also the community because they're you know you never get to know who you get to meet and who you get to see and hang out with you know until you start interacting with people you know this whole that game, is true this whole game is a social platform it's all about like you know, enjoying yourself and making connections that essentially lead into other connections. Um, it's that's all VR chat really is in a nutshell. You know, there's going to be, you know, dark it's sides. True. There's going to be dark sides to, you know, social <laughs> platform. There always is, you know, every, every social media platform has this issue. Every social game has this issue. You know, there's no escaping it. There's always yeah. going to be some bad eggs, but you can't use the bad eggs as an example for the entire platform. And that's something I do strongly believe That is in. true. Um, I can agree with that. Yeah, I'll say there's... Because, yeah. And there's definitely people out there that are, you know, not so decent people. But they don't define who the platform uh, is. They define their own selves in that regard. When it comes to something like VR chat. It's a social platform of an unprecedented scale. You've got Facebook, you've got Twitter, sure, you've got Instagram, but it is a completely different environment to pretty much everything else that we have experienced over the past 10, 15 years. You have SL, sure. You've got all those other slight comparisons, but there has never been anything this immersive, this interactive, period. You're going to have a lot of bad apples. You're going to have people who want to break or abuse the game. You're going to have people who want to break or abuse the law. It, it's going to happen no matter what. Something as big as VR chat, something as connective or interconnective as VR chat that allows people to represent themselves in whatever way they want, it's going to happen. I mean, look at Roblox. You see the same kind of shit over there. It's no matter what going to be an aspect of any VR social platform that is of any relatively large size. It's an unfortunate aspect of social media in the modern day, but at least in VR chat's case, they have taken a lot of steps in recent memory to at least try to negate some of the problem, which is a lot better than their attempts in the past. But it's nice to see that they are actively trying to combat um, some of the issues that we've been facing for, in some cases, upwards of seven years. But at least they're starting to crack down and uh, sort through some of the more prevalent issues, which I do appreciate. Oh, yeah, of course. And, you know, it's it's crazy to think about that this platform has been around for 10 years. You know, I it it, it has evolved so much. It's, crazy. it's, it's almost unrecognizable, 
you know, from the olden days till now because of how much has changed, because of the complexity of avatars and worlds, you know, the cultural change from 2014 to 2024. We had a whole pandemic, you know, during that <laughs> span, you know. It's true. It's, 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 a, it's a really crazy, like how easy it is nowadays to get access to a VR headset, you know, uh, or three hundred dollars, man. Three hundred dollars, right? You know, and most places you can find online for cheaper if you know where to look. You know, True. not saying not saying you should do that. You should definitely uh, <laughs> you should definitely go buy from the original retailer. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, I, I <laughs> but. But yeah, no, it's 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 a lot easier to access now um, than it ever has been, um, and now you can play on your phone, so you don't even need a headset, you know. And it's funny enough yep. uh, on the on the last episode, um, I kind of brought this topic up, so I'll ask you the same question. Um, you know, if there was something that because you've been around for a while, if there was something that you could bring from nowadays VR chat and bring it back to the past. What would it be and why? Oh man, that's fucking hard. You know what? Honestly, I mean, if if something like EAC was just at the door right off the bat, I don't think we would have had anywhere near as many issues as we have with client users or, well, any of that sort of shit. I almost want to say that that would have been what I choose, but at the same time, Anyone who's worked with EAC or played games that involve EAC know how much of a nightmare it can be. I don't know if VR chat would have needed that back then. <laughs> no matter the potential benefits. I guess... If we had the same avatar creation capabilities and world creation capabilities back then that we do now, VR chat would be in a totally different fucking place. Like, I, I mean that in a few ways. But you wouldn't have had a lot of competitors pop up if we had a lot of these capabilities early on because VRC would have been the best right off the bat. You wouldn't have had a lot of what we have today. So I'd probably say avatars and worlds. The way that development goes for them nowadays, if that was brought back in time. Uh, you know those futurism memes where like the 1960s thought everything would be like fucking flying cars and shit? That'd be VR chat now. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly the shit that we would have today if people had a baseline of like modern sdk oh my god it'd be insane no absolutely and it's funny because i i mentioned that this was question was also asked on the last podcast with uh wushi um and he kind of had the similar kind of a similar mindset but not necessarily with the avatars and worlds but with uh mm. the the mobile ports because if they were able to take the uh, mobile ports back in that day, you know, the quest side oh, will be a, a lot. The quest side will be a lot more optimized. There'd be more, you know, people interested within VR chat because Damn. of the mobile side. Um, but that the, the the avatar and world side is another great way. Which I mean, it's since true, you have though. so many you know hours, what? he's right though. He is right. If Android was given more time and attention back then, first, he's right. That, that would be way more impactful than Avatars or Worlds, without a question in my mind. That would be the more impactful uh, choice. Yeah. So he's right. <laughs> you know, well, I would say there's really no wrong answer. It's a, you know, the, everyone's going to have their own yeah, entire opinion. But, yeah. Um, it was just something, it was, that, that question kind of stuck with me from the last episode. And I was like, that's a really, like anybody that has a certain amount of hours or more, I kind of want to ask that question because, you know. It's a good question. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll say it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely one to think about because like we've said numerous it times is. now, you know, it, it's gone from so much, you know, from the original SDK, yeah. you know, to now SDK three, um, you know, fizz bones now into, you know, uh, whatever they're called now, what squishy bones or whatever, <laughs> like, uh, did they get renamed or are they not fizz bones anymore uh, or whatever they're Fuck. called? Uh, whatever they're, they're... I'll cry if they're renamed again, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and going 
from Unity. Oh God, I don't remember the original Unity that they used, but now into 2022 Unity, like it's crazy. I think it was 2019. Was it always 2019? Uh, I thought... Not 2019. No, not always 2019. No, I meant like the SDK the one that I mainly was... worked with was 2019. Yeah. But there yeah, was I... there was an SDK before that. Don't listen to me. I'm being schizo. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, but yeah, no. Uh... VR chat is an ever evolving platform, and you know, I definitely to this day can still see the massive potential that it can do. Um, you know i agree but you know don't i'm saying this now this is not a this is not a jinx for y'all to shoot yourselves in the foot i love you guys vr chat i love you guys <laughs> don't do it don't do it anyway i anyway but yeah so it <laughs> first and foremost like it's it's definitely first of all this is absolutely an amazing time i want to thank you for coming on the podcast because we are we are just about out of time um i'm surprised once again it does not feel like an hour for me um hopefully it didn't for you either (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i'm i'm used to talking for a long time and if you get me talking i I have a tendency to keep going which is probably why i get myself in so much trouble but i like talking (laughs) Fair enough. Um, well, before we head off and call it done here, um, you know, I do want to give you a chance to, you know, essentially shout out any, you know, socials that you have, any uh, community socials, literally anything that people can find you or, you know, the three communities that you talked about. Um, um, but yeah, I'll say the, flo- the floor is yours. Take it away. <laughs> Let's see. Pretty much all of the community's uh, social media was wrapped into one uh, social media name. It's Abyssal Media Group. Um, You can find the Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, all that shit. Um, As for myself personally, I used to do content creation before I started doing professional work in the VR industry, but sometimes I still upload. All my socials are just Blaze Creek. I think my Twitter's the the Young Blazer. Something like that. No. It'll, be, it'll be on the screen and in the description. Well, I'll have you. I'll have you send all the links and stuff, so that way I can get them all in there. Yeah, I'm down. I'll do that. As for <laughs> anything else, uh, I don't know, man. Listen, I've, I've, as, as has been mentioned, I've been around for a long time. I've played literally every major VR social platform, whether that be VR Chat, Resonant, Rec Room, <laughs> fucking Neos, CVR. The list goes on and on. Well, I guess Massive Loop too. But the list goes on and on and on. There's over probably about 50 VR social platforms. And my my wish for all of them, hey, I've played literally all you guys. I've met the community of who knows how many platforms. All of you guys are fucking awesome. Literally every VR social platform that I've had the chance to interact with in any capacity, personal or pro- uh, professional, Everyone's been amazing. No matter the platform, the communities have all been very accepting, especially VR chats. So, good on everyone. I think everyone matured a lot since the old days of VR. I think a lot of old communities grew up. I think a lot of leaders grew up. And I think we're living in one of the best times for VR in general. Whether you're just a player, or you're a member of a community, or you do something, you know, a little more advanced like you're a content creator or you make worlds whatever this is probably the golden age to be in vr you have so many options you've got so many amazing places to visit and you've got a lot of incredible people just a couple clicks away no matter if you're on pc vr or even on your phone it is literally the best time to be alive if you're a fan of vr no absolutely 1000 percent agree um but yeah no blaze great thank you so much again for coming on the podcast this is absolutely a blessing um so (laughs) yeah yeah i say well with that being said uh ladies and gentlemen everybody inside and outside the ballpark that is it for episode 27 of the never notes podcast uh if you enjoyed what we talked about please make sure to leave a comment down below you know kind of 
you know what? Just put poi down in the comment section. Fuck it. Why not? You know, put poi. I'll send some hapus. <laughs> but but just, just put a bunch of poi's in the comments. Let's see how many poi's we can get in my comment section for this episode. Uh, but yeah, make Hell sure yeah. <laughs> make sure to, you know, leave a like if you enjoyed. Um, if you're coming back watching some of the other episodes, why not hit that subscribe button? You're already coming back anyway. But with that, I want to thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next episode. Take care and peace. Bye-bye.